So for those of you in the room who follow Jesus, um, if I were to ask you, what do you think is the biggest barrier, ceiling, danger, a limitation in your faith journey uh, in following Jesus, the thing that holds you back the most, what do you think it might be? And there, there could be a whole bunch of things. I mean, you might say it's the attacks of the enemy, you know, because when you begin to follow Jesus, it's like you get uh, on your back at target sign, the enemy comes after you and he shoots his fiery darts at you and could come through people or circumstances or just life that happens around you. And you feel like the enemy is constantly attacking you and, and that kind of limits your progress in moving forward. Or perhaps... Uh, deep inside of you, there's some things that you believe about yourself and about who God is and how He works or doesn't work, and, and those beliefs uh, become something um, which have become like a narrative for your story, and maybe there's something that's not quite right with those beliefs, and, and those things shape how you view God and shape how you view, view your, uh, everything to do with faith, and th there comes a point where you realize there's some things that need to be unlearned and other things that need to be learned for you to be able to progress. Um, maybe, and this happens a lot, maybe uh, you're carrying a sense of offense because someone has hurt you, someone has done something to you, and uh, somehow you put that blame upon God for letting it happen to you, and it's like the walls of your heart have gone up, and they've become hard, so the Holy Spirit is not free to move in your life and to be able to work and, and to reshape and mold your heart, and, and that becomes a thing which limits you until the point where you realize, actually, there's power and great freedom and, and forgiveness and releasing people and inviting the Holy Spirit to come and bring healing into that space. Or, or maybe you think you just need to know some more about the Bible. Like you know a little bit of it, but not everything, and you've never read it through. Not that like you have to read it through, but you, you just kind of think like, maybe one day I'll be able to read the whole Bible through, and then I'll know all the stuff, you know? And, and until then, you feel like a little bit limited. Or perhaps you're looking for evidence of God at work in your life, and, and you, you think that He works in other people's lives because you've heard them tell the stories, but you haven't seen Him work in your life, so you're wondering if there's something wrong with you because you know, He seems to do everything for everyone else, but when it comes to you, it's just like He's not showing up. And all of these things can kind of limit your progress in, in a journey of discipleship or apprenticeship to Jesus, or, or what we would say is of spiritual formation in the way of Jesus, and where the things that around you and the choices that you make, the habits that you have, that make you and shape you to become more like Jesus, all of these things can limit you. But I think there's one which is so subtle that we don't even know that it's there. And I think it's one that, that affects all of us. And if we, if we don't pay attention to this one thing, and notice when it's there, I, I think it becomes like a, the underlying thing that is the undoing of everything else. And, and you want to know what it is? This is what it is. Familiarity. Familiarity. In other words, I know the Easter story. I know what happened. Jesus died on the cross. He came back to life. I prayed the prayer. I got my salvation. I'm going to heaven. I know it. I've got it figured out. I know how God works. I know how prayer works. I've read my Bible. I've got this thing figured out. And over time, what happens, we become a little bit arrogant, a little bit overconfident, a little bit familiar in our faith journey. Church, I know that's how it's the same every week. You sing songs, there's a message, there's a response moment. Sometimes there's something good to eat, some, sometimes not. Sometimes the coffee's good, sometimes not. I've got it figured out. And if I could say it another way, I think this is, this is, the, this is the biggest thing, is, is you're in danger of losing a sense of wonder when it comes to Jesus and the story of Easter and the pages of Scripture because you're so familiar with it that you don't feel like there's anything more that you can learn or that, you, you know, you just expect how God's going to work and you, you lose a sense of wonder. And, and wonder is such a beautiful thing and so important. But here's the thing. We live in a world that I think has literally like squeezed the wonder out of life. Because everything happens so fast and so quickly and so right now. I mean, you know this because when you order something on take a lot and it says it's going to be like three to five days, you freak out because you want it tomorrow, right? Everything should be happening. Uh, uh, is it just me? No. <laughs> okay, there's a few honest people in the room. And uh, we, we want everything now and so quickly. And not only that, but everything needs to have an explanation. It needs to have some logical reason as to why it's happened. I mean, if your power goes out and it's not load shedding, what do you want to know? You want to know why and who's responsible. It's like you want to figure the mystery out. And in life, there's, there's not any more room for, for mystery. 
everything is systemized and has to have a logic reason and, and it, it, there's a process for everything, an explanation for everything and, and, and it, it removes the wonder. You know, my mom, bless her, she would take a toothpaste tube and squeeze every single little bit of toothpaste out that tube. I remember going to her as a kid and saying, Mom, the toothpaste finished. And she'll be, take a look at it. And it, like, it's pretty flat, right? And she'll be like, nope, you're still good for a week there. <laughs> so take it back to the bathroom. And like, some of you know what I'm talking about. Like, put your thumbs in there and really try to get that last little bit of Aquafresh out there. And then eventually go back to her again and say, Mom, the toothpaste really finished this time. And she'll say, nope. And she'll get the scissors and cut it open. And open it. And they say, you still got another two days of toothpaste in there. And give her a peanut butter jar that's nearly finished. I mean, I love taking a peanut butter jar when, when you open it for the first time, right? And you take a knife and you just like get a whole bunch of peanut butter there and you put it on your toes. But, but you, you're, mom, peanut butter's finished. You're like, nope, you still got about 10 slices in there. You say, like, <laughs> and she'll finish with a, a peanut butter jar. You didn't even need to wash it. And maybe it was because we live far from the shops and she didn't want to, you know, make the trip to get into town to top up toothpaste, peanut butter. I, I don't know. But, but I think that's what happened in life. It just squeezes the wonder out of everything. So there's nothing left because everything is so rushed and it has to be understood. But wonder is a beautiful thing. I don't know if you can remember when, when you were a kid, when you had that sense of wonder. I mean, I saw it this morning because Amy put some Easter eggs in, in our kids' breakfast bowls and they were set up before the kids woke up. So our youngest son, he came through this morning and he's like rubbing the sleep out of his eyes and, and looks grumpy as anything. He comes through like this and, and suddenly he opens his eyes and, and he sees this bowl full of Easter eggs where cereal normally is. And his face just went from grumpy to... <laughs> and there were Fruit Loops there. He's like, oh my goodness, this is the best thing ever. And it's a sense of wonder. I remember going down to Waterworld in Durban. Some of you from KCN might remember that. And we'd heard the stories. We'd never, never actually been there, but in the car we were talking up, talking up, talking about what we heard. And we got into the entrance of Waterworld and they had this little water feature thing there, which was like a kind of mushroom with the water falling off the side. And we're like, ah! And we ran, we're all jumping around under the water. And suddenly we looked and we saw the super tube. We're like, Wow! And we ran to the first super tube and the next one and the next one, the next one. Isn't it beautiful to be like a kid and, and just wonder and wonder what you're going to discover next and what's going to happen and all these feelings of, oh, it's just, it's just crazy, this excitement. This is the sense of, of wonder. And I, I think this is what Jesus means when he says, unless you become like little children, you will not experience or inherit the kingdom of heaven. And to be clear, he's not talking about going to heaven one day. I think what he means is this. Unless you have in your life a sense of wonder like a child, a sense of dependence, a sense of faith, a sense of what if, a sense of imagine what God could do. If that's missing from your life, what's going to happen is you're going to miss out on a whole lot of the kingdom of heaven here. Because he's not talking about heaven up there, out there somewhere. He's talking about the reality of the kingdom of heaven that he came to bring. The one that we pray when we say, Father, your kingdom come and your will be done. Now, here today, if you don't have wonder, you're going to miss out on what the kingdom of heaven is like here today. In fact, I would say that without wonder in your life, without space for wonder of what if, what could, the suddenness of God, I, I think spiritual formation, becoming more like Jesus, I think it's impossible. And this is what we tend to do, systemize everything and have a process for everything and a three-step program for discipleship and, and this track and this thing. And we're just learning and learning it. And everything needs a reason and explanation. Something happens. We want to know why. We want all the details. We want the scientific explanation for what happened when a miracle happens. And, and, and we leave no room in our lives for wonder. And Eugene Peterson, he wrote this. It's not easy to convey a sense of wonder let alone resurrection wonder to another. It's the very nature of wonder to catch us off guard, to circumvent expectations and assumptions. A wonder can't be packaged. It can't be worked up. It requires some sense of being there in the moment, sitting present. It requires some sense of engagement. The way of Jesus, it can't be imposed or mapped, but it requires an active participation in following Jesus as he leads us through some Sometimes familiar or sometimes strange and unfamiliar territory in circumstances that become clear only in the hesitations and questionings, in the pauses and reflections where we engage in prayerful conversation with one another and with him. 
So I want to invite you, as we, as we look back on this Easter weekend and the significance of it, is to be captivated by a sense of wonder of who Jesus is and of everything that happened in that moment and what it means for your life today. That it, it, it requires a sense of being present and engaged and being part of the process of what God is doing. So Jerusalem, 33 AD, it's Friday. Jesus is being put on trial. The crowd has rejected him and said, we don't want him. Give us Barabbas. Crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. So Pilate hands him over to be crucified. And he's crucified in agonizing pain on a criminal's cross. But not a cross that's like up there on the hill. More like one that is, is kind of this big and at eye level on the side of a busy city street. So that as people walking by can look him in the eye and spit upon him and mock him. And hurl insults upon him. And there is put between two criminals. And as the pastors are by looking and laughing, the soldiers are mocking him and they're shouting, hey, well, if you're the son of God, why don't you save yourself? All of a sudden it gets to 12 p.m. midday. The sun is full in the sky. And there's a moment where God himself seemingly puts his hand in front of the sun and blocks all light from the city of Jerusalem. In fact, the whole region of Judea. And the scriptures say, and darkness covered the land. And I would imagine that the crowds were shouting and hurling insults upon Jesus. And all of a sudden, it's, it's not like a cloud. It's not an eclipse. But suddenly, there's just complete darkness in the city as if it's the dead of night. And, and I imagine those shouts of insults turn from insults into screams of terror and fear. And people think, maybe this is the end of the world and everyone's freaking out. I mean, this is, this is beyond like load setting, state eight. This, this is like really, people are freaking out in Jerusalem. And then I imagine it becomes like the sense of dread. Everyone's wondering what's going to happen next. Lighting candles in their homes. Families gathering their kids in. Like, come inside. We don't know what's going to happen. Is this the end of the world? And, and this picture, it, it echoes back to Genesis chapter 1 where the darkness covered the water. And it, it, it's a picture. Like, it's a symbol of something is about to be created. God is at work. He's busy doing something. But in this moment of darkness, these three hours of darkness, this is the moment where Jesus is taking upon himself your sin and my sin. This is the moment where he takes the wrath of God and the judgment for everything that you and I have done wrong and all our rebellion against the Father in these moments of darkness. Maybe it was God's grace to everyone else to cover Jesus in darkness while he bore our sin because it was too horrific to look upon. This is what's going on in this moment. The ninth plague, when God was taking the people out of Egypt thousands of years before this moment, the ninth plague was one of darkness. Covered the land. The tenth plague, the killing of the firstborn. There's significant symbolism in what's going on in this darkness. Quiet. The city's dead still. Now all of a sudden, three o'clock comes around and Jesus cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And they run to him and they give him a sponge with vinegar on. They say, maybe he's calling Elijah. Let's see if Elijah's going to appear. You know, the prophet from, from long ago, maybe he's going to come and save Jesus. So mockingly, they give him this wine to drink. And Jesus takes a sip. He pushes away and it, with, with his head. And, it, and then in one breath, he, he cries out, it is finished. And he gives up his spirit. And the darkness retracts and the sun comes back. And I imagine there's this silence upon the city. One of the Roman soldiers calls out and he says, surely this was the son of God. Because at the moment when Jesus shouts out, it is finished, the earth begins to shake. There's an earthquake that comes. I mean, this, the timing is divine, it's supernatural. And the earthquake, if you read through the Old Testament scriptures, it's a picture of God's judgment. In fact, at Sinai, when God gave the covenant to the Israelites, the mountain of Sinai was shaking. It's almost this picture, the symbol of the old covenant where there was a shaking is now done and a new season is coming and the earth is being shaken again. And as things are shaking, people are beginning to scream in terror and the buildings are rattling. But not only that, the rocks are split open and the tombstones that, that cover the sepulchers on the hillside all burst open. And this isn't good for Jewish people because they were about to go into the Sabbath. And when you did that, you, they would go through a preparation and you didn't want to go near a dead body. And now all of a sudden, the tombs are open. And I imagine again, all the parents, are like, they just sent the kids outside because the sun came back. And they're like, come back inside, kids. We don't know what's going on. And the earth has been shaken and, and the tombs are open. There's chaos in the city. No one knows what's going to happen. And the, the priests at three o'clock, they gathered in the temple because what they do at three o'clock in the afternoon is they begin preparing for the evening sacrifice. So the way that this worked in the Jewish culture is they would have to take a sacrifice into the presence of God to atone for the people's sins. 
And the temple was made up in three parts. There was the outer court where everyone was welcome. Then there was the inner court where, you know, only the priest could go. And then there was the holy of holies. And this is the place where the high priest could go only once a year. And inside the holy of holies was the Ark of the Covenant with the tablets, the Ten Commandments in, and the mercy seats and all these things. This is where the presence of God dwelt amongst the people in, in the holiest inner sanctum of the temple. And separating the Holy of Holies from the inner court was this big curtain or a veil, but it wasn't just like a shower curtain. I mean, it was a curtain. It, it was as big, some say, as, as the floor of this room, 15 meters by 20 meters and four inches thick of woven fabric hanging from the temple as this heavy divided to stop people from going into the presence of God. Because if, if someone that was sinful stepped into there without the right conditions, they, they would be killed. So the priests are gathered there before this curtain, ready to perform the evening sacrifice, and all of a sudden the earth begins shaking, and they hear screams and shouts outside, and they don't know what's going on. And in that moment, it's as if this invisible hand comes out of heaven and cuts the curtain, not from bottom to top, but from top to bottom. And the way into the presence of God is open. Could you imagine being one of those priests? Why you stand, like the walls are shaking and you hear the people sh shouting outside and the next thing you look and the thing you're not supposed to see and the thing you're not supposed to look at because you would die if you even looked upon it, suddenly the curtain, I, I imagine they're like, don't look, don't look, don't look. And they, and they look up and, and suddenly it's open and they see into where the presence of God is. And, and this, is, this is a beautiful picture. It's a symbol of, of, of God saying, the sacrificial system is over. You don't need to come back to keep making sacrifices in the temple anyway because the sacrifice has been made. Jesus has given his cross. He's life on the cross once and for all. The sacrificial system is over. I wonder what God is going to do next. Can you imagine being in the city and all these things are going on? And there's a little bit of an anticlimax because nothing else happens. Jesus' closest friends, they go to Pilate and they request, can they take his body down and bury it in the tomb? Everyone's kind of surprised he died so quickly. So they go and they put him in the, in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And this Friday evening now, and then Friday evening is the beginning of the Jewish Sabbath. So on the Sabbath, there's no work permitted. So everyone's in their homes and, and they're eating meals together. So everyone kind of goes back into the Sabbath. But before this happens, the, the Roman soldiers, they go to Pilate and they say, hey, we better you know, seal up the tomb because if we don't, these crazy fanatical followers of Jesus, they're going to come and take his body and they're going to say that he's back from the dead. So in Matthew chapter 27, verse 65, the exchange with Pilate and the guards, he says, we'll, we'll take a guard then and, uh, and go and make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. So imagine this picture, the hillside full of tombs, all the tombs are open except for one. The tomb is sealed, and there's a guard posted outside. And the Sabbath comes and goes Sunday morning. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. And there was a violent earthquake. There's another earthquake, another shaking. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, he rolled back the stone, and he sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The gods were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. I love that. I mean, this is the Roman army, right? The most <laughs> powerful military force in the world. And they see the angel like, ah! And they fell and they shook and they became like dead men. And the angel said to the woman, do not be afraid. I mean, this is amazing, right? The two women are just standing there and the soldiers are, are lying in shock, dead, <laughs> as if they're dead. For I know you're looking for Jesus Christ who was crucified, but he's not here. He is risen, just as he said, come and see the place that he lay. And you know what struck me when I was reading this? Is Jesus came out of the tomb before the stone was moved, according to Matthew's account. Like they saw the angel come down, roll the rock away, sit on it, and say, Jesus is not in here. Which means that there must have been a point where Jesus came back to life and he just kind of whoop, out the tomb and it was still closed and all the tombs are open, but one is closed, Jesus is not in there. And I think that the angel came to roll the stone away so that, that we'd have evidence that he's not in there. I mean, it's not like, okay, Jesus, we're gonna get you out now. Just hold on, just gonna move the stone. This is the wonder of the gospel. And this is, this is being captivated by it. Is this not like some fairy tale story? I mean, this is historically documented stuff that happened. And sometimes we lose the wonder of who God is and the power of this story and the significance of all the things that were happening in this moment. 
So the angel said to the woman, don't be afraid. I know you're looking for him. He was crucified. He's not here. He's risen, just as he said. So come and see the place where he lay and then go quickly and tell his disciples. He's risen from the dead and he's going ahead of you to Galilee and there you'll see him. So now I've told you. So the woman hurried away from the tomb and they were yet filled with joy and they ran to tell his disciples. And suddenly, suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. And they came to him and they clasped his feet and they worshiped him. And then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee and they will see me. In the Gospel of John, he adds some detail about what happened. Chapter 20, verse 3. So Peter and the other disciple, they'd now got the news that Jesus is not in the tomb. They started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and he reached the tomb first. He bent over and he looked in at the strips of linen that were lying there, but he didn't go in. And then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. And he saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. And finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside and he saw and believed. And, and this, this is a, a lot of verses dedicated to grave clothes. But there's something which is beautiful about this is, is the reason why it's here is because these guys arrived at the tomb possibly with the assumption that Jesus' body has been stolen by grave robbers. Like grave robbery was a thing back then. So I imagine they had their pick of graves because all the tombs are standing open, right? But they go into Jesus' tomb and, and they see the linen is still lying in its place. Which means that the way it's written, it's this picture that Jesus' body is wrapped inside the linen and all of a sudden when he comes back to life, he just kind of evaporates out of the linen and moves through the tomb wall and the linen just falls where it lay. And the cloth is still folded, separate from the linen. And these guys are like, well, if it was grave robbers, like how would this be possible? How would this stuff be folded? How would it still be there? So, and it's this detail which gets the disciple, John, the author of this, he said, and it's in that moment when he saw the detail, the evidence, he believed. He's back from the dead. And sometimes in our lives, all it takes is a little bit of detail, a story from someone else, a testimony of what God has done for faith to rise in our hearts to say, I believe this. I believe it. It starts to make sense now. Like it's unexpected. It's not, it's not what I was thinking, but, but I believe it. And then to backtrack a little bit to Matthew, the way that he writes this, he writes, it, he writes a verse first, but it actually happens later in the chronological order. He says, um, 27 verse 52, and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. So think about this for a moment. Friday evening, tombs bust open. Everyone's in their homes wondering what is going on. No one's come out of the graves yet. I'd always imagined this in my mind, like when Jesus died, that's when the, like, you know, zombie apocalypse, everyone's back from the dead. But the tombs are just standing open, waiting for something. And Sunday morning, when Jesus comes back to life and, he, and he's resurrected, suddenly all these people whose tombs are open also come out of the grave and they start walking through the city. I mean, can, could you imagine if it was you? They're like, hey, Grandma! And you too. It's like a big family reunion. It's like, well, this is unexpected. And all these people are coming into the city. But, the, but here's, the, here's the symbol. Is, is when Jesus gives his life on the cross and he shouts, it is finished. That means the penalty of sin is done. That means death has lost its power and the tomb of your life is thrown open. But you need the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit for you to be able to walk out of the tomb. And sometimes what you need between the revelation that the penalty of sin has been taken care of and the walking out of the tomb is you need a Sabbath in between, which is a space to wonder, what would my life look like if I actually believed this? If I put my faith and trust in that Jesus has opened the tomb of my life, the things that have been holding me back, the things that have been limiting me, what if that is dealt with on the cross? And all I need is a bit of time to wonder and engage the person of the Holy Spirit to empower me to literally walk out of the tomb and walk into the city and appear and be a testimony to many people. And sometimes what's missing is, is the sense of wonder of what is it that God wants to do? What could my life look like if I was captivated by the wonder of the gospel, by the power of Jesus Christ? and his resurrection life. You know, the incredible thing about this story is that it's so unexpected. Jesus has been journeying with his disciples. He'd been dropping hints the whole time about what was gonna happen, what was coming. They hadn't been 
picking up, what he was putting down. So, so when he dies on the cross, they didn't see this coming. And when he comes back to life, they're like, oh my goodness, we did not see this coming. They, it even took them some time to recognize that it's him back from the dead. And, and this is the thing about the way that God works, is when we try to predict or expect him to work in a certain way or according to a system or a program or a process or something like that, I, I think we're going down the wrong path. But we should leave room in our lives for a sense of wonder, a sense of the unexpected. Like if we could say it like this, to expect the unexpected. Did you come into a church gathering on an Easter Sunday? Are you expecting the unexpected? Or are you expecting the same thing as always happens? Because when it comes to God, what we see from this story is he's a master of the unexpected. And this is the essence of wonder, is to catch us off guard, to break our assumptions and to break the stereotypes and the ways that we have and, and to help us undo some of the things that we've learned to say, well, this is not all the way, always the way that God shows up or how he works. It's completely unexpected. And, and what I love about it is it, it's so undramatic. I mean, it's dramatic in the sense that there's darkness and earthquakes and open tombs and all these kind of things. The veil is torn and the, the way into the presence of God is, is open. That's dramatic. But Jesus, this is what he doesn't do. He's like, hey, I'm back from the dead. Gather everyone. Gather the whole city. Let's have a celebration. I'm back. And march up to the Romans and the Pharisees and see, like, hey, I'm back. And, and get crowds following him in the streets like, and, and, and start a movement. That's not what he does. He's, he's very undramatic. He meets two women in the garden. And he says, hey, greetings. Go and tell the disciples I'm back. And sometimes you and I expect God to move in this big, dramatic way. And we expect to feel all these things different. We're looking for this experience of how God is going to work. And, and sometimes the revelation of who Jesus is to us in our lives happens in the most unexpected, undramatic, ordinary, mundane moments of life. Maybe even when you're sitting through a Sunday service and thinking, when is this guy going to finish? <laughs> Who knows what God is about to do in your life? Could this be the moment where you're battling to stay awake when suddenly Jesus is next to you and he says, greetings. <laughs> I wonder what God is going to do. I wonder what God is going to do with you today. I wonder what God is going to do in your heart. I wonder what healing God is going to bring today. I wonder what God is going to restore. I wonder what tombs God is going to throw open. I wonder what life the Holy Spirit is going to put upon you that you can walk out. I wonder what graves God is going to turn into gardens. I wonder what beauty he's going to bring from the ashes of your life. I wonder what healing he's going to bring from the hurt that you're carrying. I wonder what freedom he's going to bring from the unforgiveness that you've been wrestling with. I wonder what it's going to look like on the other side of the moment when he breaks your addiction. I wonder what God is going to do. Here's what I know. He uses the most unlikely of people. The text I read to you, Matthew chapter 28, verse 1, it said, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. Mary Magdalene, if you read back in some of the scriptures, you'll find she has a dodgy track record. We don't know exactly what it was like, but it wasn't good. She was possessed by seven demons. That could mean that she literally had seven demons and Jesus removed them from her. Or it could mean like she was mentally unstable, emotionally, like a basket case. It could mean any of the above. But in this society of Jewish culture, it's very patriarchal. So a woman at this time, their evidence would not even be, or their testimony would not be considered in any kind of legal matter. In other words, like woman did not have a voice. So Mary Magdalene is like at the bottom of the bottom of the bottom of the list of reliable witnesses for anything. And yet Jesus, in his compassion and grace and undramatic way, somehow picks her to be the first preacher of the gospel. And I want to say to some of you in the room that you have no idea of the potential that you have in you. And some of you, you, you think you are the most unlikely candidate to be used by God. Expect the unexpected. If you'd said to Amy and I that we'll be here in Centurion in 2024, two years into church plant, if you told us that back in like 2006, we would have laughed at you from the pub that we were in. It's unlikely undramatic, unexpected. And this is the way that God works. 
And there's an invitation for you to be part of the story because of his finished work on the cross. He's taking care of the penalty of sin. He's opened the way for you to come boldly into his presence. It's undramatic. It's unexpected. And he uses the most unlikely of us. So what is our response? How is it that we are to cultivate wonder in our lives for what Jesus is about to do? Well, the, the first thing, the first challenge, encouragement I have for you is could you slow down enough to wonder? Could you stop being so busy? Could you stop rushing from this thing to that thing to that thing? Could you stop squeezing the wonder out of your life because of your schedule? Could you make space in your life where you could begin to wonder what could God do if I gave him space? Could you create a Sabbath moment in your week which is just space to begin to wonder again, to begin to dream again? But there's a beautiful picture in the way that Mary Magdalene and the other Mary respond to Jesus' greeting. I don't know if you noticed it, but it says they fell down they clasped his feet and they worshipped him. And in the, in the Hebrew scriptures, the word for worship in the Old Testament, is the, the Hebrew word is shakach. And what it means is, is to bow down and to worship. And it, it, it's a picture of reverence and awe. And it's a picture of worshipping someone who is greater than you, superior, and this is the Old Testament picture of worship. This is how people would worship God, is they would praise Him because they have this great reverence and awe and almost a fear of Him. So they would worship. But, but in the New Testament, the word for worship is a Greek word, proskuneo, and it means to move towards with the intention to be intimate. In other words, when, when you give someone a hug, it, it's a moving towards for close proximity. And in their response, this is what we see. On the one hand, they, they fall down, to worship Jesus because I would too. He's back from the dead, right? Like what else do you do? It's the appropriate response. But they don't worship from a distance. They grab his feet. I don't know if you've ever held someone's feet before, but that's pretty intimate. And in this response, there's a beautiful picture of what it means to have a sense of wonder for who Jesus is. On the one hand, there's an awe and a reverence and a bowing down and a worshiping him as the king the one who holds everything together in the universe. And on the other side, there's a closeness to him and an intimacy because of what he's done. Because he's put the righteousness of himself upon us so we can come into the presence of God. And if you want to develop a sense of one day in your life, you have to hold these two things in tension. Because if you are at a place where you worship God from a distance, you're going to be fearful of him, you're going to be in awe of him, but you're going to miss out on the intimacy and the relationship and the closeness that he has for you. But if you just have this closeness without any awe and wonder of who he is, this is when we get familiar and just go, well, yeah, you know, me and Jesus, we're buddies, we're friends, he's my bro. We get a little bit familiar. So I think a healthy place to be for wonder is to hold these two intentions. Say, yes, Jesus is, is king, all hail King Jesus. He's the creator of the universe but he's also mindful of me. And he's also a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And when we get that right, this tension of the awesomeness of God, but the authentic, close relationship that we have with Jesus is in that place where, where wonder is cultivated in our lives.